All right, guys, let's get into this discussion today <clears throat> about well, almost five years ago now. I, uh, I made a video, one of my very first videos on YouTube. And by the way, if you're not following us on YouTube, if you're listening, you're probably, you probably may not be. It's at youtube.com slash order of man. If you're watching this video now, obviously you are connected with us on YouTube. Regardless, I did a video, like I said, roughly five years ago, and I titled it Eight Skill Sets Every Man Needs to Master. And then I did another video several years ago called Nine Skill Sets Every Man Needs to Master. Uh, that first one that we released... Uh, I want to say it has just about 600,000 views, which is pretty amazing. It's pretty incredible that that many people have seen it. And there's been some debate as to whether they agree with it or not. Uh, but I was really curious if I were to go back now, knowing what I know five years later, uh, would I say the same things about skill sets that men need to master? And surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly, but interestingly enough, most of the skill sets that I went through were very similar to what I believe now. <clears throat> and that's what I wanted to share with you today. This isn't an exhaustive list. Uh, it is titled eight skill sets that every man needs to master. I realized that the likelihood of us actually becoming a master in these skill sets is maybe not even possible. I mean, what is a master? It's a good question to ask, but somebody had pointed out on Instagram because I had made a post on there and I'll talk with you about that in a minute about these skill sets. Uh, they said we could just take a lifetime focusing on one of these and still not become a master, which I agree with. But I also responded to this individual and I said that that may be true, but the pursuit, the pursuit alone of mastery, whether you get there or obtain something or not, the pursuit alone is a worthwhile investment. And it's going to help you lead a more fulfilling, profitable, enjoyable, successful life, however you define that. So we're going to get into this. Again, I know it's not exhaustive. I've isolated eight skill sets I believe that every man should master and should work towards. I believe that there are other skills outside of what I'm talking about here. So please don't think that I forgot something or, or this is it. Like this is the only thing I think about when it comes to being a man. And I've got some bonus um, skill sets as well based on some feedback on Instagram because I had made this post on Instagram yesterday. By the way, if you're not following over there, make sure you do at Ryan Mickler. My last name is spelled M-I-C-H-L-E-R. Very, very active over on Instagram. And I try to stay as engaged as I possibly can with, uh, with you guys there. Okay, let's get into this. Again, eight skill sets every man needs to master, not exhaustive and also not in any order. Number one, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, is physical strength. It is imperative, imperative that we as men learn to get strong. Now, I... I don't know what it is about some guys, but they just want to create all the little exceptions and find all the little places where it's not, you know, it doesn't apply. I realize that maybe physical strength isn't as important as it once was, but you are going to be a more capable man when you're strong. Bottom line. Now I'm going to probably have people say, well, what about guys who are, are injured or disabled? That doesn't absolve them of the responsibility to be physically strong. Now they may not be as strong as somebody else, they may not necessarily be as physically capable as somebody else, but that doesn't mean that they can't improve themselves. And it's not about comparison to other individuals. It's about comparison to yourself and who you were 24 hours ago. So continue to make yourself strong. David Gilmore in a book called Manhood in the Making. If you want a good book, that's a good book. Uh, it is pretty detailed. It's not very anecdotal. It's more scientific and uh, a lot more detailed. But if you're interested, it's a great book on generally and throughout most of cultures and, and all of history, what it has actually meant to be a man. So it's called Manhood in the Making. He talks about the difference, the distinction between being a good man and being good at being a man. A lot of you guys are familiar with Jack Donovan. He talks about the same concept and the distinction between, again, a good man and being good at being a man. When I look at what it means to be a good man, uh, I think we're talking more about the morality of a man. That's what it means to be a good man. But morality doesn't necessarily translate over into capability, which is what it means to be good at being a man. So you can have a moral man who is completely incapable and he might be a good human being, but he's not good at being a man. I hope that distinction makes sense. On, on the other side of things, you can have 
a, a man who is good at being a man, but he's missing the morality component. He's missing the good man component. So I think you should have both. You should definitely be working towards both. But to me, it's undeniable that somebody who is fit, somebody who is strong, uh, somebody who is conditioned, uh, somebody who really cares about the body they have and is tuning that body is going to be more capable. He's going to have more energy. He's going to have more uh, excitement and passion and, and, and opportunities. Uh, he's going to have more stamina. Like it's just, it's going to be better whether he's at work or in a relationship or any facet of life. So what I would suggest is that you find a way to become physically strong. Now, this isn't a podcast about the best way to do that. There's an infinite number of ways to do that, but ultimately you should be training. You should be strength training. Yes, you're going to want to do conditioning and other things as well. And you have other things that you're excited about and I get it, but you should be strength training. You should be lifting heavy things, putting them down and then lifting them back up again. I use Sorenex a lot. Um, they, they've, they make some amazing exercise equipment. Uh, I've used starting strength in the past who does, a, uh, they do a phenomenal job. I've been heavily, heavily involved in CrossFit for the past five years or so. So many different ways to do it. Again, I'm not debating which is the best. I'm just telling you, we've got to get physically strong. There's all sorts of opportunities and circumstances which may arise in which we'll need to be physically strong and people will look at us for that strength. Number two is learning to be an assertive communicator. You've got to be an assertive communicator. I've talked about this, I think, at length in the past, but there's four primary modes of communication. <clears throat> there's an aggressive communicator. There's a passive communicator. There's the passive aggressive communicator. And then ultimately the highest tier of communication, which is assertive communication. The aggressive communicator is the jerk. He's the a-hole. He's the guy that nobody likes. He railroads, he bullies, he pushes people over. And yeah, he might get the job done, but he leaves a wake of collateral damage in his path and usually will only experience results short term until people catch on to him. They realize they don't like this individual and no longer want to be led by this individual and who this person is. On the other side of the spectrum, you have the passive communicator. This is the wimp. This is the weenie. This is maybe even the nice guy, the quote unquote nice guy. Uh, Robert Glover wrote a book called No More Mr. Nice Guy, which I highly recommend. By the way, guys, I'm going to give you a lot of resources today. So just have your notepads handy or come back and check this out. But a great book is called No More Mr. Nice Guy. Uh, talks about not being the nice guy. Being a nice human, but the nice guy is different. Um, he gets friend zoned. He's railroaded. He's pushed around. He's bullied. His opinion doesn't matter if he shares it at all. He's a people pleaser. He wants everybody to be happy and he's not willing to take care of himself. Now, the passive aggressive communicator is really a, a, he's, he's a, he's a bit of both, right? But he's disguising. He, he's probably falls more in line with the aggressive person, but he's disguising it as, as being nice, right? He's, he's not, he knows that he shouldn't be the a-hole. So what does he do? He uses humor and sarcasm to take that edge off, but it really just ends up coming back as manipulative and condescending and arrogant. Now I'm not saying we can't have fun and we can't tell jokes and, and we can't push each other around and, 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 and mock each other to a degree if it comes from the right place. That's not what I'm suggesting. But I am saying that if you are the type of guy who can't take anything seriously, who can't make straight comments to an individual, has to do it underhandedly or around their back or take little pop shots, that's a pretty good indicator that you're not being assertive, you're being passive aggressive. And it's not effective way of communication. Now the fourth and what I would consider the elevated tier of communication is assertive. This is a man who knows what he wants. He's willing to communicate that to individuals. He's not so concerned with other, what other people think of him. He can share his thoughts and ideas. Even if people don't agree, he doesn't throw temper tantrums or have meltdowns or think that he's being persecuted just because somebody happens to contradict what he says. He takes new ideas and new inputs, but ultimately he speaks his mind and he shares what needs to be shared from his vantage point. It's, it's a much more effective way to communicate with people. It's not always comfortable, especially if you're moving from an, a passive to a, an assertive, but it's a very, very powerful way to communicate with individuals, to get what you want and to help other people get what they want as well. 
uh, what you want and what other people want is it's not mutually exclusive. In, in a lot of ways, they can actually align perfectly, but you need to be an assertive communicator in order for that to happen. Uh, another resource I'll give you, again, get your notepads out for this one because I'm going to give you a lot of resources, is the assertiveness workbook. So if you recognize that you are an a-hole and nobody likes you, assertiveness workbook. If you recognize that you can't share your opinion or you're afraid to or people railroad you or talk over you, assertiveness workbook. This is how we move into assertive communication. Number three, self-defense. Initially, I put martial arts down here, and martial arts is a component of it, but I wanted to broaden it out. So I think that you should be making yourself into a weapon of sorts. You should be training your body and your mind in order to protect not only yourself, but to protect those you have a responsibility for, whether that's your family or your coworkers, your neighbors, potentially even complete strangers. You should be training your mind, your body, your, your whatever, every, every aspect, your intellect, your every part of you should be trained towards self-defense. Now, we talk a lot about one of the core tenets of being a man is that of a protector. Well, you can't be a protector if you don't know how to defend yourself and other people. And what I've seen a lot of men do is they believe that if something goes down, if it hits the fan, that somehow they'll miraculously turn into this superhero. And it's not the case. There's a quote by, I think it was Epictetus. I might be off on that. But he says, we don't rise to the level of our expectation. We fall to the level of our training. So if you aren't training your body in martial arts, if you aren't learning how to handle a firearm, this is actually a big one. If you own a firearm, but don't train with it regularly, you might actually become a liability as opposed to the asset that you're supposed to be. You need to train yourself in physical altercations, in natural disasters, in things that might come up uh, that you need, again, to protect yourself and other people. Uh, there's a lot of great resources on this. Uh, Clint Emerson, who's coming on the podcast again, former Navy SEAL, is going to talk with us about that. Uh, we had Pat McNamara on several weeks ago. We have James Yeager, who's coming on the podcast very soon. Uh, I hesitate to name names because I'm going to leave somebody out, but Go back and look. Uh, Colonel Dave Grossman is another great resource. He wrote a book called On Killing and On Combat. In fact, I probably have him somewhere back behind me. Uh, and we did a podcast with him as well and talked about the body's physiological response to threats and negative situations. Very, very powerful interview. In fact, his interview, his question or his response to what does it mean to be a man is probably and likely my favorite answer in over 200 uh, episodes where I've asked that question. So you should be, you should be capable in administering violence in the right context. Again, being good at being a man and being a good man. So a good, excuse me, I'm back up being good at being a man. Somebody like that could administer violence, but if you don't have the good man, the morality part figured out, you probably ought to work on that as well. Maybe that's a bonus. So that was number three, self-defense. Uh, specifically with regards to martial arts. I like jujitsu. I'm not going to get into a debate about which is the best martial art. Uh, they all have their validity and being well-rounded is probably going to serve you best. So maybe that's Muay Thai. Maybe that's boxing and wrestling and karate and jujitsu, but learning the arts of administering violence. And then of course the self-control and restraint that comes with it as well. And I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, number four, emotional resilience. I have seen so many videos lately of men, uh, males, we'll say males, males who cannot control their emotions. They're, they're emotional. I should say they're overly emotional. They allow their emotions to control and dictate their behaviors, typically not in the best way possible that, that doesn't help them or anybody else. Uh, they, they cower they get completely railroaded by the smallest of circumstances. They lash out at other individuals all because they're letting the stimulus or I should say the response of emotions to circumstances dictate their behavior. Your emotions are an indicator. I've talked about this at length. They're an indicator of something that's working and something that maybe is not working. You don't need to be overly emotional. You don't need to, the new age thinking is be 100% vulnerable and exhibit all of your emotions. No. Are there times? 
Sure. But there's also times where you need to suck it up. You need to not display those emotions. You need to strive to understand those emotions and then drive forward in the best way possible using the indicator of emotions as a metric, a metric, not the only metric. So if you're angry and that's the only stimulus you're using to respond, you're probably not taking in all the input that you could. There's also reasoning and logic that you probably ought to take into consideration. Uh, a great resource on this would be stoicism. Uh, I've had two, potentially even three, I can't remember right offhand, two interviews, maybe three, with Ryan Holiday. He wrote a book called Obstacle is the Way, Ego is the Enemy, and Stillness is the Key, and then a, a fourth book called uh, The Daily Stoic. All great resources. If you want to go back to the source, then you probably ought to read Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. That is a classic. That is a book that I recommend that every man read. Um, I have 10 on that list, and that is definitely on that list. Marcus Aurelius Meditations. Get introduced to the idea of stoicism. I'll tell you this. Stoicism is not the suppression or absence of emotions. It's a quest to understand and then respond accordingly. Number five. Now, this is my background. It's financial acumen. If you don't understand how the resource of money works, you're going to have a hard time creating fulfillment, creating wealth, creating sustainability, offering services in a market, uh, adding value in economies. You need to understand how this little green piece of paper we call money works. You need to earn, understand how to make it. You need to understand how to keep it. You need to understand how to protect it, how to budget it, how to invest it, how to keep it from the government legally, not tax evasion, tax avoidance. There's a distinction. Tax avoidance is legal and I believe moral. Tax evasion, on the other hand, is illegal. So I'm not suggesting you do anything illegal, but I'm telling you that you ought to take advantage of tax codes that are going to play to your benefit so you can keep more of your hard-earned dollars. You need to learn these things. Uh, resources. Uh, Dave Ramsey has some great beginner resources on paying off debt and budgeting. Uh, there's a great book if you want to learn about how the stock market works called uh, A Random Walk Down Wall Street. That's a great book. Um, Investopedia is a great place online to maybe not get individual financial or investment advice, but to start to understand some of the terms and 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 the the nomenclature that's used to explain how the, how money works. Uh, what else? Let's listen to podcasts, read the book. I mean, whatever you can do, find people who are financially successful, turn to financially successful people, uh, hire a financial advisor. Uh, Daniel Crosby wrote a book called, oh, I might butcher this one, the laws of wealth. I believe it is Daniel Crosby, the laws of wealth. One of the best segments of that book is he actually goes through and gives you a list of questions and ideas and considerations when you're looking for a financial advisor. So if you're in the market for a financial advisor, and this was my background, so I agree with everything Dr. Crosby said in this, uh, pick up that book, Dr. Daniel Crosby. I believe, again, it's called The Laws of Wealth or something like that. You'll find it, Daniel Crosby, The Laws of Wealth, and uh, you'll be able to make a more informed, more accurate decision on, on who you hire regarding your, your financial planner. That's number five. Number six, effective networking. You don't make decisions in a vacuum and everything that you've created in your life is not solely due to what you have done. There has been somebody else in your path, a father, a mother, a mentor, a coach, a counselor, a teacher, a friend, uh, a business partner, Somebody in your life has helped you accomplish what you have and no opportunity will present itself without a connection to another human being. Now, I have been very, very fortunate in that we've got this podcast and through the podcast, I've been able to network with and meet some of the most phenomenal, successful men on the planet. Now, not all of you are going to start a podcast and I'm not suggesting that you do, but I am suggesting that you learn how to network. And I'm not talking about going to sleazy and cheesy networking meetings. Some of those have some validity and, and importance and relevance to them. I'm just talking about learning how to connect and relate with under other individuals. Ultimately, learning how to serve other people in a way that's meaningful for them and helping those people win. 
Um, in fact, like I said, I was at Origin Factory uh, earlier this morning. Uh, I was talking with Pete, and he had invited somebody who I introduced him to. Uh, and, and I have no gain from that, but it was an opportunity for me to help these two individuals get connected and they're both going to win and succeed because of that. And the world famous Zig Ziglar says, if you help enough people get what they want, you will inevitably get what it is you want. So I've prided myself on learning how to create relationships, learning how to serve other individuals, how to find out what it is they're after, and then be the mediator, for lack of a better term, between what this individual wants and then the resource they need to have it. And I make introductions like that because I enjoy networking. I enjoy seeing my connections and my friends win. And that requires me knowing what people want, what they're after, having other connections that I can make introductions to. And uh, it's been a very, very powerful way to excel. Yeah, I feel fulfilled, but I also excel, excel because these friends, these acquaintances and these networking connections, they want me to win too. It's reciprocal. So you don't have to be the sleazy car salesman guy. It's not what I'm suggesting. You don't have to hand your card out to every individual who might actually buy something from you. That's not networking. Okay. That's sleazy sales tactics. Networking is finding other people who you can help, figuring out how you can help them, and then giving them that opportunity. Period. That's all networking is. And I've been able to make some great connections. And because of those great connections, we've accelerated very, very quickly within order of man. And I met my wife and uh, name it, any opportunity that I've had. My, my other businesses have come because of the networking, the ability to connect with successful people. Uh, number seven. So six again was effective networking. Number seven is physical presence. Now, initially when you hear physical presence, you might think that I'm just talking about being present in the moment and being aware and situationally aware of what's going on around you, being present. Of course, all of that stuff is very, very important. But there's another dynamic to this. And this dynamic, it's something that gets overlooked quite a bit because, well, I don't know necessarily why it is. Let me tell you what it is. It is your ability to present yourself in, a, in an effective way. It's the way you look. It's the things that you wear. It's the way that you carry yourself. It's like keeping your shoulders back and having your chest out and making eye to eye contact and shaking somebody's hand properly. This presence, this awareness of yourself and how you're portraying yourself to other people is very, very important. And I'm not suggesting you manipulate it. And I'm not even suggesting that you fake it till you make it, but you ought to be very, very aware of the message, the nonverbal message that you're sending out into the world when you walk into a room or when you shake somebody's hand for the first time or when you make eye contact with that individual or when somebody looks at you, what do they think about you? What messages are you sending out without having to say anything? And the sooner you can figure that out and move in the direction that you want to move, the better off you're going to be. Now, people will say, well, real men don't care about how they look. That's not true at all. I've got a great friend called Tanner Guzzi. His name is Tanner Guzzi, uh, who uh, talks a lot about uh, style and not only style, but the psychology of style. And one of the things that he does a series on is real men, quote unquote, real men don't care about how they look. And he shows all of these men throughout all of time and history and how, what they wore and why they wore it and what they were adorned with and what it signified. Uh, and he has said that in that series, the, the men who seem to care most about the, what they're wearing is the warrior class. <clears throat> and it's the war. Uh, the reason I think it is, and we've talked a little bit about this, Tanner and I, is because warriors know the true cost of battle. They're intimately familiar with the cost of engaging in war. And because of that, they would rather posture. This is my hypothesis anyways. They'd rather posture and prevent rather than get themselves into battle because they understand that cost. And so they'll do things, they'll say things, they'll wear things, and they'll communicate verbally and non-verbally how powerful they are, uh, how capable they are. It's that show of might in a way so that they can avoid confrontation. Now we can take that evolutionary hardwiring and psychology and apply it to modern times. If you look 
attractive people, both men and women, get more opportunities, more opportunities with the opposite sex, more opportunities for promotions and jobs. They make more money. And you can think, well, that's not fair. You can think about real men don't care about how they look. You can do all of that. That's fine. You can play that game. It's just not reality. So your feelings don't really matter in the case. The reality is that the way you look and the way you present yourself matters. It speaks volumes to individuals and you can ignore it and you can play ignorant to it, or you can recognize it and use it as a tool. Just the way a carpenter would use a hammer to build a house, you can use your presence and the way that you're non-verbally communicating with other individuals as a tool and a benefit to help you accomplish more and produce effective outcomes for you and other people. If you want a great resource on this, I would definitely follow Tanner. Tanner Guzzi, his last name is spelled G-U-Z-Y. He's very, very active on Twitter. You can find him there and follow the man. Learn from him. Figure out what works. Figure out what doesn't. Um, we're going to get more into the other side of physical presence in here in a minute, but uh, that is something that's very, very important, something that's overlooked and quite often dismissed by men who think that they're above the way they look or it's not important, and it is. Uh, number eight, <clears throat> and this is the last one that I wrote down on my list, and then I've got four or five bonus points based on what these guys shared on Instagram. But number eight is continual education. Continual education. A lot of people seem to believe that once they get done with high school or, or, or college that they've got their degree now, the learning is over, they don't need to figure out anything else. Well, I mean, you're, I guess you can do that, but if you're not open to new information, you're not learning new skills, you're not evolving and growing and expanding, you're selling yourself short. Um, I just got an email before I hit record on this podcast and it was a gentleman who he, he apologized and I really wasn't sure what he was apologizing at first. And what he said, uh, in the email was that he didn't generally agree with what I believed about masculinity and he dismissed what I was doing because he didn't agree with all of what I was saying. And then he, uh, encouraged other people not to listen to the podcast because, of how wrong he thought my, my ideas were. Um, but he said, you know, I've, I, I've listened to you. Um, I listened to another podcast you were on and he can see how I've evolved and how my thoughts have matured and he offered that apology for not necessarily giving a, a fair shake, which I actually really appreciate that level of humility. I mean, obviously in this case, it, it feels good, but just that level of humility in any situation to admit to some maybe wrong thinking and try to rectify that situation. But it's a testament to the power of evolution. You know, you'll hear people who say, you're just not the same person you used to be. That's right. I'm not the same person I used to be. And if I was, that would be the problem. The problem is not that I'm evolving, that I'm growing, that I'm changing, that I'm a different person. The problem comes when you're the same person. So continue to grow, find things that are interesting and fascinating, uh, be curious, explore, learn, say yes to things that normally you wouldn't say yes to. Open yourself up to the broad possibility of what this life has to offer and you'll be very, very surprised what you'll find and where it will lead. Five years ago, six years ago, I never in a million years thought we'd be leading this organization and we'd be impacting millions and millions of men across the planet. It started because I thought it would be a cool idea to figure out how to podcast. And so I podcasted with my old financial planning firm. I started a podcast and you know, it didn't work. I enjoyed the medium of podcasting. I didn't want to continue to have that financial conversation. And so I pivoted and here you are listening to the order of man podcast after doing this now for five years, it's grown, it's morphed, it's evolved, it's become something new, it's become better because I, I hope and I strive to be open to continual education and continual learning. So those are my eight skill sets. Now, you inevitably listened to this and thought that you agree with some, you probably disagree with others. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure that you have your, your, your list in your head of things that you think should be included here. And if that's the case, that's great. I would love to hear that. You can share that in the comments on YouTube. Uh, you can hit me up on Instagram or Twitter, both at Ryan Mickler. My last name again is spelled M-I-C-H-L-E-R. I made a post on Instagram the other day and we talked about uh, my eight skill sets and then um, a, a bunch of men chimed in and gave their thoughts. So I thought I'd share those as bonus with you. I'm not going to get it in depth with you, but just some more meat to chew on, if you will. 
So the bonus answers that the guys gave on Instagram, number one, survival skills. So yeah, learning how to survive in a, an emergency, a natural disaster, some sort of situation where you might be out in the wilderness or find yourself alone or you have to get out of a situation. I definitely think hunting is there. That's something I've been very, very uh, involved with over the past two years. Um, but shelter making, building a fire, food storage, anything to keep you and other people alive. Another one was self uh, control and then also self awareness. I think that those self control and the self awareness could probably fit a little bit into the emotional resiliency. <clears throat> I think stoicism addresses both self control and self awareness. I also think the self control side of things can be uh, focused on when it comes to self defense because you begin to learn more about yourself. So I realize there's a lot of a lot of uh, crossover in these, but I thought those were worthy of consideration. Self control, self awareness. Uh, another one, spiritual strength. Uh, the individual who said this and several individuals did say, said walking with God. Now that's something that I choose to do. I choose to follow his path. Uh, God is present in my life and an important factor in what it is that I do in my business and in the community and with my family. Uh, I, I'm sure it's like that for a lot of you guys. If it's not God, okay. Some sort of higher power, higher calling, some sort of tapping into something that's above and beyond yourself. Maybe you want to call it the universe or energy or multiple gods. I don't know. I don't know what you call it. I call it God. That's what it is for me, whatever it is for you. But there's power in having some sort of higher authority, higher compass. It's probably the best thing is it's a compass to keep you grounded in reality and move you in the right direction. When we deviate from the compass, things go south quickly. Every time I've ever deviated from that path, things have gone south. Every time I've, I've made a conscious decision to stay on that path, things have went well. A lot of guys say they don't want to subject themselves or put the mercy, put themselves at the mercy of, of a God or the universe or whatever it is. Well, okay, that, that's fine. But these self-imposed limitations and parameters in which we operate are going to serve you. It's the whole discipline equals freedom mentality. It just goes deeper and, and broader than that. Uh, another one that somebody talked about was leadership. Wholeheartedly agree. Leadership is critical. A third component of what it means to be a man is to preside, to lead effectively. And by incorporating all of the eight that I shared with you today, I believe that you're going to be a better leader, a more capable leader, somebody who has vision and can guide and, and direct and cast the vision and help people get to a place that they could not have imagined going on their own. So leadership, a critical component of, of manliness and masculinity. And the last one, uh, and I kind of lumped these all together, but it's just, it's, it's basic handiness. So auto repairs, plumbing, electrical, fixing other things around the house, being creative, building projects, working, doing woodworking, working with your hands. The more uh, that you can be handy, the more capable you are, the more reliable you are, the more frugal you can be because you can do a lot of things yourself. Uh, but there's value in being handy. I have not always been handy. I'm not the most handy guy now, but I'm constantly learning and evolving and figuring things out. It used to be that I changed light bulbs. Well, now I can wire a, a, a fan. Uh, it used to be that I could just fill up the gas in the gas tank. Well, now I can change my own oil and I can uh, diagnose what's going on when I can't get the car to turn over. So we, we continue to learn, which is a point that I made, point number eight, and we get better and we approve ourselves as, as being handy. So those are some bonuses. Again, you're going to have a lot of bonuses as well, so please share. Uh, we're going to call this one a day, but again, let me just recap here and we'll let you get out to it. Again, guys, I know this is not an exhaustive list. I get that. I'm not even suggesting that it is. I'm not suggesting that this is all you need to know. It's just to get the wheels turning a little bit and you thinking about what you should master. Number one, physical strength. Number two, assertive communication. Number three, self-defense. Number four, emotional resilience. Number five, financial acumen. Number six, effective networking. Number seven, physical presence. And number eight, continual education, continual learning. So that's what I've got for you guys today. Again, connect with me on YouTube. If you're not already watching this video, if you are watching the video, maybe you just want to listen to the podcast when you don't have access to YouTube or don't have time to sit down and watch a video. You can do that too. 
Uh, connect with me also on Twitter and Instagram at Ryan Mickler. And as I part today, I just want to tell you that I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you being on this path. Whether you realize it or not, you being on this path with me is helping me to become more capable. It's helping me be accountable and responsible for what we're talking about here and every other facet and corner of what we, we address. So we'll sign out until next week. Next week, I believe my conversation with Jack Carr, Jack Carr, author of Terminal List and True Believer, goes live. So you're definitely going to want to subscribe to the podcast or on YouTube. And uh, we've got some other great interviews lined up. All right, guys, get out there, take action, and become the man you are meant to be.